I suppose to, to answer the first question, I'm a Dublin O'Donnell. I'm not from, I'm, I keep getting asked which, which part of the Donegal O'Donnells am I? I'm a Dublin O'Donnell, okay? We just get that out of the way first. Uh, first of all, I want to thank Joe for, for inviting me here and just to tell you my family thanks you as well because I'm very passionate about this and are suffering from UHI fatigue at this stage. But I, I suppose the first thing to say is that when you're talking about UHI, we need to be clear what we're talking about. We're not talking about universal health care, which we're all for, sure, who wouldn't be? What the government are talking about is a funding model. And they're saying the only funding model in town under universal health insurance is a competitive insurance model. And all their consultation and all the submissions they look for are premises on the basis that the only model in town is a competing insurance model where insurance companies compete. And we don't accept that and the trade union movement don't accept it. And for the next few minutes, I hope to explain to you why we think that is not a very good idea. Everybody, of course, we're in favour of universal health care. Universal health insurance, yes, but it depends on the funding model you use. What we're saying is that the competing insurance model is not a suitable model for, for Ireland, and I hope to convince you of the same. So basically, if we go back to the programme for government, they boasted that this would be the government, the first government in the history of the state to commit to a universal single-tier health service, which guaranteed access to medical care on the basis of need rather than income. And it says that UHI will be designed according to the European principle of social solidarity. Access will be according to need and payment will be determined by ability to pay. All sounds like really good stuff. It says workers and employers will pay into a UHI fund with the state covering the full cost for people on low incomes and partially subsidising payments for those on middle incomes. Risk equalisation will prevent health insurers from refusing any person because of their age, disability or health need. And universal health insurance will provide the system for hospital funding and access to free GP in the future where money will follow the patient and the patient will no longer be seen as a cost but rather as a source of income for hospitals and other health providers. But the reality is that the, health, the system of universal health insurance currently being put in place falls far short of this ambitious vision which was only set out three years ago. Despite that statement of the go that the government priorities for 2014-2016 reaffirms that the government is committed to the model of competitive insurance. Though I understand when uh, the new Minister for Health was speaking here uh, on Tuesday, he wasn't quite as enthused about the model as his predecessor, uh, and we actually think that, that that's a good thing. The, the previous Health Minister's refusal to complete, contemplate anything except a competing insurance models, but ourselves and other organisations have lobbied to slow down, let's look at what's out there. We all agree it needs to change. The problem is that you're only invited to, to comment on a model that's been predetermined, and that is a huge issue, and I think that's something that's fundamental to getting a discussion going uh, for the future of healthcare in Ireland. Um, they've also said that UHI will not cost the Exchequer another penny. Now you need to think about that because it's very hard to imp implement change without actually investing in, in the first place. And the failure, uh, uh, the, sorry, the exchequer will incur no additional costs under HI. And uh, the failure after all, they, in the initial one, they said the employer will pay. And we'll come on to the Dutch model in a while. But that's being dropped now. So the state's not going to pay and the employer's not going to pay. So we need to see who's left on the pitch. And I go back to one of the, the diagrams shown earlier. Well, two of the three kind of people have been taken out of the pitch in terms of what's being proposed. So what it's going to mean is that most citizens will pay more for their health service. The hospitals and other health services will continue to struggle to keep the budget while meeting the demand. And it will still remain a two-tier system. Or it could be a three-tier, as those who can afford to pay more will continue to be better served. The failure to learn lessons from abroad, including from Holland, on which the proposed Irish system is most closely modelled, means that the government plans to introduce UHI and hospital clusters run by trusts will most likely be an expensive failure. I'm not sure if people caught the BBC news today, but the BBC announced that a quarter of the trusts, the NHS trusts, which most people hold up as the models, actually uh, are in deficit. At the end of last year, they were in deficit and in difficulty. And again, that's a model that we're looking to emulate. The Dutch model of UHI has actually created an under-resourced three-tier health system where up to half a million people are uninsured or unable to pay insurance premiums. Over 90% of the population buys additional private health insurance. Meanwhile, more than half of the Dutch hospitals have faced bankruptcy, while some have closed. Holland, which unlike Ireland has historically had a well-funded healthcare system, also experienced substantial start-up costs and ongoing administrative costs. 
Prior to introducing UHI in 2006, Holland injected 5 billion into reduced waiting lists. The government proposals here are to inject nothing. Actually, their proposals are to take more money out. Additional resources were also put in place to establish the system, and they recruited 500 additional administrators just to administer the new system. We believe that the proposed UHI system in Ireland will, if anything, be less viable because it's built on a foundation of sound. When announcing the programme, the then Minister said a number of building blocks would be put in place as precursors to the introduction of UHI. These included hospital clusters, community health service clusters, money follows the patient system, and the establishment of a health pricing office and a patient safety office. The most important of these have yet to be established. Of the six proposed clusters, hospital clusters, only two have CEOs, and there are signs that one of them may be heading off to Cork County Council fairly soon. The HSE has gone out to the market and they have been unable to recruit permanent CEOs for four of the six hospital clusters. In other areas, like Chief Finance Office and Chief of, of Operations, those posts still remain unfilled. On paper, we have a structure of six geographical hospital clusters, but the reality on the ground is they are neither oper not operational nor likely to become operational in the foreseeable future. Aside from anything else, the failure to implement these cornerstones of the health reforms in three years doesn't inspire confidence that the equally significant change to a new funding model will be easily achieve, achieved. After significant delays, we understand that the community health clusters will be launched in September. You'd be forgiven for thinking that they may match up with the hospital clusters, but no. There are six hospital clusters, and as far as we know now, there's going to be nine community clusters. And I haven't yet found anybody who can explain how they will line up with the hospitals and as the clusters are all going to be independently funded bodies, it's not clear how patients are going to move seamlessly from one body to another. So how do you move from hospital into community because they're all going to be independently funded trusts, all fighting for, for their own survival? Meanwhile, the money follows the patient's approach has been tried out unsuccessfully in a number of areas. This failure is not surprising as we lack, lack the necessary data management systems and sufficient numbers of properly trained staff to input data in real time to ensure that the hospitals get paid for the procedures they carried out. Right now, there are insufficient hype coders, and that's just the name of the people who input the data. So there are backlogs of information. Staff are being put under pressure to hit target volumes rather than maintain the accuracy of the data. So it's more important to have your data within, within 5 days, 10 days, 15, than to ensure the data is accurate. Yet, the accuracy of the data is going to decide on what funding you get uh, going forward. In short, the structures necessary to allow the funding model to be changed are nowhere near working. Staffing levels are also an issue. Despite the frequent and unfounded claim that we have too many administrators in the HSC, the numbers have decreased significantly to the extent that management are now using agency staff to fill clerical and administrative vacancies in frontline settings. Yet, the proposed UHI funding model will require a substantial increase in clerical staff, just like the Dutch did, as there will be a huge amount of extra paperwork involved in recording activity, making claims, etc. And I see no evidence that this has been factored into the proposal. So who is going to pay for this? While it doesn't say it up front, the government's UHI proposal tacitly acknowledges that the health system is currently underfunded, and it envisages that the health service users will cover the shortfall. Health spending fell more in Ireland than in any other European country between 2008 and 2011, with cuts of more than 2.7 billion and 12,000 fewer HSE staff, and that's according to recent research by Trinity College's Resilient Project. The Trinity team concluded that while the health system managed to do more with less until 2012, there are now diminishing returns from cuts, so the system is now doing less with less. Despite improvements in health service management, the authors have questioned the system's ability to implement the current reform programme. Bear in mind that the initial proposal included an employer's contribution to UHI, as happened in Holland, and that, as Health Minister James Riley was clear, the UHI will be introduced at no additional cost to the Exchequer. So what does that mean for an underfunded health service? Well, it means that the extra revenue will be raised through individual insurance payments, and by far the biggest burden will fall on one-third of the population individuals and families who do not currently have private health insurance and who don't qualify for medical cards. 
It's safe to assume that most people in this category, which could be said to typify the so-called squeezed middle, simply cannot afford private health insurance, yet they will now be compelled by law to pay. Even if the seemingly optimistic official price estimate, and I'm using the Minister's figure of 900, which is probably less realistic than the 1600 you use, but for fear of contradiction, we're going with the Minister's figure. And that's including for children, whereas in Holland, the children up to 18, you don't have to pay for them. That, 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 that won't happen here. If that figure is correct, it will place an impossible financial burden on families and individuals. A family of four who currently has no health insurance because they can't afford it could end up with a bill of 3,600 a year. Politicians beware, because this will certainly make the existing property tax and water charges look very modest by comparison. But those who currently have health insurance will pay more too. If the new minister sticks with the existing plans to withdraw tax relief on health insurance, and if that's not enough, the Dutch have experienced a continuing rise in the price of compulsory insurance, coupled with increasing restriction on the health services covered. So what will we get? Well, while we don't know what, it, what we will get, what we have seen is some papers that outline what could be in the basket. Um, the only firm commitment so far is that there will be a single queue for treatment. Although UHI does not herald the end of the two-tier health system as originally claimed, because you will be able to buy better cover if you can afford it. The White Paper promised the Commission to make recommendations on what should be included in the health basket that basic co cover will buy. By kicking this central question into touch, the Minister and the Department can remain largely silent on what services are likely to be excluded, although the Department of Health documents suggest that your €900 Euro will buy you less than the current system provides. If I suffer a stroke and attend at A&E, it's likely that the current €100 Euro charge will still apply, and that's according to the Department's documents. And let's assume that my hospital treatment was covered by UHI. But what about the speech therapy, OT, medication that I'm almost certain to need, possibly for a very long time? According to the department's document, I'll get it for a year. After that, who knows how I'm going to pay for it. Are these covered by compulsory insurance, or will they be defined as add-ons that I'll have to find additional money for? Do we really want insurance companies deciding what treatment we should get, where we should get it, and for how long we should get it, because that's what happens in Holland. And what about dental or elder care, even co-payments for GP visits, which appear to be likely as and if when free GP care is introduced? The Dutch model shows that the cost of the taxpayer and users increase while the basket of services covered by the basic package shrinks. Most Dutch take out additional insurance to cover elder care, dental and allied health services. I mean, in fairness, the main concerns of an insurance company is to provide a return for their stakeholder. So that obviously has to be built into whatever the cost is going to be. A Department of Health document from March 2004 shows that year on year, the UHI system will cost more than the current system. It states, the review has shown that general taxation typically performs better than other financial systems against the assessment criteria, and there is no compelling argument as to why we would move away from our current funding mechanisms. So their own documents are telling them that they shouldn't do this, but the good news is we're ploughing ahead. So let's look at the options. If we want to improve the health service, and most of us do, the first question to ask is, what do we want our health services to do? The second question is, how much will a service of that nature cost? And then the final question is, well, how do we fund it? In Ireland, we're doing this backwards. We are reconfiguring our health services around a predetermined funding model, not knowing what it is supposed to fund. We have also fallen into a trap of using the term universal health insurance, when what we actually mean is universal health provision, and the two things are not the same. In fact, there are many models, including successful models, of funding universal health provision. The competing insurance UHI model has been selected without consideration of the alternatives, and in this respect, this rush consultation has been a complete sham. The competing insurance UHI model is deeply flawed, and it's totally inappropriate to Ireland's geography. It's underfunded health service and the current precarious state of our family finances. It is largely based on a system adopted in the Netherlands, where, despite additional investment, which has been ruled out in Ireland, it has resulted in an inefficient funding system different tiers of entitlement, steadily increasing premiums and rising hospital deficits. The Dutch have also experienced higher hospital readmission rates than any other country because the model creates financial incentives to discharge patients too early. 
A real consultation would consider the merits of other approaches to universal health cover, including those adopted in France, Germany and the Nordic countries. The single-payer social insurance system adopted in these countries are providing equality of access to what by Irish standards are high quality, well-funded and efficient health services. This is what people imagine when they call for an end to the two-tier health system. It's the opposite of the expensive, unfair and unpopular fiasco that's likely to result from the UHI experiment in health service reform. And ministers and TDs will be doing the nations and themselves a service if they copped onto this before it's too late.